This episode of Techzilla is brought to you by T-Mobile. Time to get our HD Nation on. It, it, it's exciting. Obviously, you know, duh, Netflix are a sponsor here, but I actually pay for Netflix out of my own pocket. You pay for Netflix out of your own pocket. Hey, give me no deal. <laughs> we spend the money, and if you're in Mexico or Central America, South America, or the Caribbean, uh, you'll be getting Netflix. Something like 43 countries will join the U.S. and Canada and all you can eat movies and TV shows, clogging the internets for one low monthly price. Uh, I just feel this huge slurp of bandwidth going through the Americas right now. <laughs> it's going to be Soon, interesting. anyway. Uh, well, it, what was really funny is looking at the comments on the blog page at Netflix, because the service is going to be available uh, in Spanish, Portuguese, or English, and Canadians that speak French, and people that hate the latest Netflix web UI left most of the comments on the blog.netflix.com oh, webpage. Haters got to hate, man. Haters got to hate. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's some angry, angry angry French-speaking Canadians out there that are just pissed at Netflix. Why? Portuguese before French? On a more serious note, you have some Blu-ray players yeah, I do. from LG and of Samsung. Wi-Fi enabled Blu-ray players. I had a couple in-house that really kind of caught my eye and I, I think they're pretty awesome. Let me just get right to it. Uh, one is the Samsung BDD 6700 and the LG BD 670. Street prices, Samsung's about $240, the LG's about $167 when I looked online. That's about a $70 difference, and we'll get into some of the reasons why you might want to pay or not that extra $70. Bucks. Both feature built-in ABGN Wi-Fi, which is great. Uh, that means not only do you get your support of popular streaming media services, uh, but also you get a selection of applications for both players that can be installed for additional functionality. I'm, I'm going to pull the plastic oh, off this. Is this it. a slot loader? It is. That is, uh, I have to say, uh, app-wise though, Samsung's, a, they have a little bit better selection. And uh, when I looked at the apps you could download, they feel like they're a little bit more matured. Uh, but I still see most folks sticking to the premium services like your Netflix and your uh, Pandora, YouTube and Vudu and services like that. But to the design on that, notice how they're both relatively low profile. That does have a slot loading mechanism on it. And for the life of me, I'm still trying to look around. I didn't, open, I didn't crack the manual to find out, but I don't see a control key on that player anywhere. So no, it's you, very smooth. If you lose the remote, uh, you, you might need a universal to deal with it. Uh, <laughs> also, as far as the back of the player on that one, another reason it might cost a little bit more is the fact that it features a second HDMI port, which you can use for a couple of things. One, it can be dedicated to do twin audio output and video output, so you can have two display devices hooked up. You could also use one as just audio only. So maybe if you have an older AV receiver that doesn't support 3D functionality, you could then just route the audio only to one to your AVR and have the video go right to the TV or other other device. Uh, App-wise, um, I got to say the 6700 from Samsung also features Hulu Plus, while LG's BD67 or 670 has Cinema Now. Also, Grace Notes Music ID service that I thought was pretty darn. Yeah, this is an example of the. These are the apps on LG's page, and here's a little reason. I, they were all okay. I, I really didn't spend a lot of time in this. I immediately jumped over, and here are the more premium apps, of course. This is where I spent most of the quote-unquote premium apps. Digging through here, these all performed beautifully and worked really well, and a good selection of tools as well. Uh, but the Grace Note Music Service on the LG is the first product I've actually tried that actually offers that in there, and there's an example. I had a Iron Man playing on <laughs> Blu-ray, and the very first intro track is back in black, and so I hit the button on the remote, and boom, in a couple of seconds, it, it tells me what song that is, what album it's from. Pretty cool, overall. Now, diving into the benchmark results, I have to say that uh, one thing that I can say right off the bat that compared to players from even a couple of years ago, fast disc handling. Uh, these things will start up and load discs so much faster than old Blu-ray players. If, if you're still using a first-gen player, I'd consider. Are we talking about like 15 seconds, 30 seconds? Start up to being active and ready to go is about five seconds. Really? And loading a disc, at worst case scenario for a Blu-ray I ran into, I think was about 25 seconds for the most Java intense Blu-ray disc. So basically, if but I, even less on some other titles. My $300 second generation, right after the the giant computers pretending to be Blu-ray players that came out first gen, so I can basically quarter the boot time for essentially. A and power consumption seems to get lower every year too. I, my power meter was actually not able to even pick up what these were consuming, which means it was probably well under 15 watts. So wow. I need to get a more sensitive power meter. But getting to benchmarks real quick, 
Both of these function supremely well, or very well, as DVD up converters when you're converting a DVD to 1080p resolution. The only real difference I found looking at both players' output was the video noise reduction abilities. Uh, Samsung was better, but chances are you won't ever need or use either player's integrated picture controls anyway. You're <laughs> going to leave that up to the picture, leave everything at default and just let the TV or your AVR do the control for that. Also, LG's noise reduction controls, they offered a range from negative three to positive three, and I just found that odd. It, is negative three adding noise to the picture? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think that's actually zero, but that should have been a little different, I thought. HD benchmarks again showed both. Great performance from both players as far as converting 1080i to 1080p and just making sure every pixel's reaching the screen. Excellent. And again, Samsung had slightly better video noise reduction. And the bottom line really is that the Samsung BD D6700, that second HDMI port, it's unique design, solid picture, import, uh, picture performance, it was impressive. However, uh, you'd be hard pressed to see the visual difference between it, its output, and LG's BD670. Both players make it easy to stay updated with built-in Wi-Fi that I love. And LG retails for about 70 bucks less, and that's maybe what, a year of Netflix? <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. Are, are you thinking about upgrading your Blu-ray player that you've had for the last couple of years? Uh, to be honest with you, no, because I uh, rip every Blu-ray that I own and just keep it on a server, and I stream it directly to a home theater PC. So, but and I use my PlayStation Three for any discs I'm renting. So, I, I do have to give props to uh, to uh, LG for having all of the control buttons on I, here. I use that quite a bit, the, actually. The, the Samsung is is very aesthetically appealing, but <laughs> I'm shocked. If, I guess having, you could, you having had the remote control lost in the couch by by various members of my family, it's always nice to actually be able to eject the disc or play. Totally. Um, yeah, yeah, a little more traditional with the LG a right. slot load design with the buttons up front, but size wise, they're both mm -hmm. very similar. Performance wise, they were. Overall, when I did all my disc timing measurements, the Samsung came out a little bit quicker, but it, it, I think it'd be unnoticeable for most people. And it really comes down to, do you need that second HDMI port, and do you need, say, oh, what else? Second HDMI port, and maybe perhaps slightly better video processing functionality, right. just specifically the noise reduction, if, if you're even going to use the internal controls on the player. And if you need that extra remote, this was like 10 bucks at my local uh, pharmacy. So. <laughs> and it actually works pretty well. So. You've I'm, been I'm waiting impressed. To off for weeks. There are good Blu-ray players to be had now. I thought you were going to say it's a, it's a good universal remote we have these that days. too. And, it's, <laughs> and I, can, I think I can use it without my glasses on. That's what I really like. Oh, uh, <laughs> high-tech Jeff had a question. He's out there in the HD Nation audience. He tweeted out, at Robert Heron, in your many years of calibrating HDTVs, how bad is picture accuracy if your backlight is set to max on the LCD? Ah, uh, the backlight. The backlight unit, or the BLU for short, that's essentially... Uh, it can be a couple of things. It can be an LED or compact, compact fluorescent-based right. uh, system in the back, and it can either be tubes of fluorescence, or it's going to be LEDs shining in from the side, usually, or in some cases on higher-end TVs, they'll have them shining in directly from the back. That control shouldn't alter at all the visibility of dark details, so that makes it an ideal picture brightness control if you just want to adjust the overall how bright is the picture. And the backlight does affect picture accuracy, in particular white balance, or the color of gray I always talk about. Uh, it determines basically the more you turn it up, generally speaking, whites will become a little bit more blue because the light itself is very blue and right. just adding more light to it increases that. Also it will determine how bright black is, so if you're trying to set up the most in best contrast you can in a dimly lit environment, well you want to keep it down as much as possible. And also, if you're viewing TV in a dimly lit viewing environment, a bright picture will produce more eye strain. So, and it won't allow your eye to fully dark adjust, and you won't be able to see more detail than you could, say, in a brightly lit room. So, it's important not to turn it up too high just for sake of doing it. However, in a bright environment, crank up, crank up the backlight and rest assured that that's one control that probably interferes less with the picture than any other control in terms of making the picture brighter. Right. I'd say the second one might be contrast, but that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, so. that's a pretty crazy. But basically, if you are in a dark room, turn it down. Turn it down. Yeah. It might take a few, because your eyes take about 20 minutes to fully dark adjust, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to pick out better detail in the dark portions of the picture, or see that, oh wait, I'm noticing black is not really black now, it's actually glowing. Right. So you turn down the backlight a little bit more, and it should be relatively low, especially if you've got the lights turned down. Do you want people to start, you know, doing their like DIY contrast lighting, you know, with the little LED strips behind their flat panels on the back wall, or that can help improve 
lesser pictures, like say the picture, say your TV is just not mm -hmm. capable of producing a very good black level, right. or there's going to be a little light, in there, or it's going to be a super dark environment, you can't lower the brightness of the TV, mm -hmm. then you would put a, a bias light or a light behind the screen, and that would help balance out the difference between what's coming off the screen mm -hmm. and the surrounding environment, so it's not such a going from pitch black to super bright white. Right. That's the one main reason for doing that. Well, However, play around with a lot of new projector. TVs today now feature an electronic eye or a light room sensor, a room mm -hmm. lighting sensor, that will automatically adjust the brightness and other characteristics of the picture automatically. And if you just, if, if you think you might be able to take advantage of that, try it out and mess around with that control to see if it's something that'll work for you. Because then you just don't have to mess with it at all. Right. When, the, when the sun goes down, the TV dims itself, or when the room gets really bright, the TV kicks it back up to where it should be, yeah, or my, where you want it to be. My terrible $400 HDTV from a few years ago that I bought on sale um, had one of those sensors. It just worked so badly. I Sometimes. ended up creating custom settings for when the room was dark <laughs> or when the room was light and just switching them. Yeah, that's how my new TV is too, and I'm, I'm digging that. Just Daytime mode, nighttime mode. <laughs> we got a question from the forums. Dare Juden says, I was looking at the fries and I noticed a TV that claims full HD 1080, but when I look at the screen's native resolution, it's 1024 by 768. So I know for a fact the TV can't do 1080p, but yet it claims every progressive and interlaced resolution under the sun for component and HDMI input. How can a TV maker claim that a TV is 1080p, but not have the native resolution to support it? Well, I looked at that ad, or at least the one you linked to, and I didn't see the term full HD 1080 or full HD anywhere in the description of the TV. Maybe it was in the print ad? Could have been. But that would have been wrong for that particular TV anyway. But you are correct, though, about the HDMI component inputs listing compatibility with 1080p video sources. Now, it's fairly common nowadays for HD TVs. Oh, I said now. I've been trying not to say now. <laughs> oh, anyway, uh, it's, it's fairly common nowadays for most yeah. HD TVs to accept any video signal up to 1080p resolution, regardless of the actual screen resolution of the display. Now, any HD TV that is labeled Full HD 1080 or Full HD 1080p, or it might even list 1920 by 1080, should indeed provide screen, uh, a screen with 1920 by 1080 pixel resolution, about right. 2 million pixels. However, any display can be labeled as high definition if its vertical resolution has 720 lines or greater. That's horizontal, uh, basically horizontal resolution isn't factored at all. So, in the sense that 42 inch plasma screen, that 1024 by 768 resolution, that's a fairly common resolution for old school plasmas, mm -hmm. in the sense that it has 720 lines of vertical resolution, so they can call it an HD panel, but that's a four by three resolution going into a 16 by nine screen. How do they make that work? Turns out they use rectangular shaped pixels to make it all fit. No comment. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's better, I guess, than like ED resolution, or if you want to go back there, but I don't think those are even made anymore. I don't, I don't want to get questions. Go 1080p e or go home. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, T-Mobile. T-Mobile's got a great selection of tablets, laptop sticks, and their new mobile hotspot. They're giving you the freedom to stay connected with high-speed internet on the go. Affordable high-speed internet when and where you want without overages. Mobile broadband data plans, like for this critter here, start at $29.99 per month. And current T-Mobile voice customers, they'll save an extra 20%. By the way, this, it's a G Slate with Google. It's T-Mobile's first 4G Android tablet and lets you take your HD entertainment anywhere. Stay connected at blazing fast speeds when and where you want. No Wi-Fi needed. Immerse yourself in the entertainment you love. Download apps, play games. I gotta put it down or I'll start playing games. Stream video and check your favorite websites. T-Mobile provides mobile broadband service and lets on-the-go wireless high-speed internet through to your choice of portable devices. It's good stuff. Check it out, people.